call for action. People don't realize when they get behind the wheel of a vehicle, they're driving a loaded weapon. We'll tell you what this woman wants done. And swim 27 times and take 27 people on his back. He's a hero by any definition. Now his hometown wants him recognized. Well, the first snowflakes of the season look set to fall across parts of Newfoundland tonight and in through Thursday. I'll let you know where coming up. Well, getting an ambulance as quickly as possible, it can be the difference between who lives and who doesn't. And if you live in Happy Valley Goose Bay, a recent review of the private operator there shows you're getting bad service nearly half the time. Here now is Bailey White reports. This review was released only after CBC News reported on long wait times for ambulances in Happy Valley Goose Bay. The review found that over a period of five months, about half the time, there was only one ambulance on the road, even though the provider was paid to offer two ambulances at all times, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that is why, at least in part, it has been taking ambulances so long to respond to calls. Louis Montague, an 81-year-old man who fell down outside after suffering a stroke, waited for more than an hour, even though he was less than four kilometers away from the hospital. He died two weeks later. You know, a town this size, we should have, there should be two on at all time. Like, why was there only one? Like, is this something we all have to worry about all the time? Labrador Ambulance Service won't return our calls, but I spoke to Wade Smith with the Provincial Private Ambulance Association. He said staffing is a problem right across the province. He says private contractors just can't compete with wages offered by the public sector. Well, government I guess, uh, uh, sets the wages basically for us, and um, that wage has been set at $21.50 per hour. Uh, it's, it's a two-way street. Um, government bears the responsibility of what they will allow us to have. So our hands are tied. Health Minister John Hagee says Louis Montague's family is owed an apology, but Montague's daughter says no one has ever approached them. We haven't heard from anybody, you know, other than CBC. This year. We haven't heard from anyone, like nothing, like saying, geez, we're sorry this happened or anything. Not a thing saying, boy, it happened or... We, we, why what what we could have done prevent it and that way no we haven't heard anything apology would be nice from somebody health minister john Hagee says things have got to change he says the health authority will be keeping a close eye on labrador ambulance service to ensure that they keep two vehicles on the roads at all times bailey white cbc news happy valley goose bay some condo owners in St. John's are getting more information at this hour about the future of their building. The Newfoundland and Labrador Credit Union confirmed it's taken control of 33 unsold units at the Sundara. And right now it's holding an information session for the 12 people who already own condos in the building. CBC's Fred Hutton is following this story and he joins us live from Mount Pearl. So Fred, how did things get to this point? Well, Debbie, some would say that uh, from the get-go, this development was doomed. Construction, the completion, was over a year behind schedule. When it finally did open, there was a downturn in the provincial economy. That made it very difficult to sell the 45 units. Now, documents obtained by CBC News last year show that back in 2014, the developers, Rockmount Properties, in which Premier Dwight Ball is a partner, signed personal loan guarantees of $10.3 million. Now, the status of those guarantees at this point is not known, but last week, the Premier told CBC that he had nothing to do with the latest developments because his business holdings, his private business holdings, are now in a blind trust. Now, unable to find buyers, last year Rockmount announced that it was going to convert the unsold condos into assisted living units. That didn't sit well with people who had already purchased properties here. They they uh, protested this and in some cases put up delays related to the permits being granted by the city of Mount Pearl to do that conversion. That led to more financial strife for Rockmount. Ultimately, they lost control of this building. Now, all of this, of course, created some stress for people who had property here, including two people we introduced you to last night. Beverly Lahey and uh, Judy Johnson told us their story. Their brother, Roger, purchased a property here, but he died last September. They told us that since then, they have been unable to get information from Rockmount about the future of this building. They say it has been a nightmare. We leave a bottle of his aftershave here, just so we can... S it, it brings them back. I, 
I don't want to keep doing that. I want to go so we can move on and let the grieving be done in our own way, not tied to, to something that's so negative. It's hard. I can't tell you how many times I've walked through that door and stood in here and said, Raj, where the hell are you? I can't believe he's gone. But it's, it's been so negative. Now, Leahy and Johnson and the other owners hope to get more clarity about the future of the Sundara at a meeting which is taking place right now in one of these uh, units behind us. As for any legal action the Newfoundland and Labrador Credit Union may take against Rockmount Properties to recover the millions of dollars owed, as of late this afternoon, no court documents had been filed at the Supreme Court in St. John's. Reporting for Here and Now, Fred Hutton, CBC News, Mount Pearl. Well, the latest shift of government jobs from St. John's to other regions of the province is now complete, but only a small percentage of the employees affected by the decision actually made the move. And as Here and Now's Terry Roberts reports, we don't know yet how much it's costing taxpayers. The parking lot outside the Howley building in St. John's. Middle of the day, practically empty. Inside, signs of change. Rows of recently vacated offices, unusually quiet. This has been the headquarters for Crown Lands in Newfoundland and Labrador for many years, but not anymore. 32 positions that were normally situated right here now transferred to Cornerbrook in what's been a very controversial decision. But only seven of the people who actually occupied those jobs moved to the West Coast and offices in this building. 24 took other jobs in the public service here on the East Coast. It's really been a great, great success in my opinion. I, I know that, you know, choices were made early that, uh, that you know, people were concerned about and, and, uh, and that they felt their lives would be, uh, would be impacted. We've offered, we've acted with, in my opinion, uh, compassion. Byrne defends the move against accusations it was purely political. We said up front, that our purpose here was to ensure that the agricultural opportunity, the economic opportunity for Newfoundland and Labrador grew and grew through agriculture. We said up front that we would accommodate, that we would provide alternatives and options for all of our employees that were affected. We've done both. Because so few employees made the move, the department is now hiring. We are staffing up. The union is not surprised at the outcome. We kind of knew that these people were not going to uproot and move to Corner Brook. They have families here, they have spouses there that's employed, so you can't just look at the individual. Earl says he still hasn't heard a logical reason for the move. Uh, was it for political reasons? Uh, that's a question that's been asked. As for the cost of the move, Jerry Byrne says that's still being tabulated. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. A car crash survivor from North River says video evidence of reckless driving on Veterans Memorial Highway highlights the need for passing lanes. More than 8,000 people have signed Pauline Quinlan's petition asking the province to act. Here now is Anthony Germain caught up with her near Donovan's in Mount Pearl. Pauline, why don't we take a look at this video? I know you've already seen it, but let's give it a look, okay? Right, so when you watch this video, it's pretty clear that you get this uh, character who's trying to pull across and really do a passing in a, in a really stupid way. Yeah. And when you saw this video, what'd you think? I, I couldn't believe it. I honestly, like Friday, there was a 42 year old woman passed away on that same stretch of highway, that same exact place. Like, I don't understand what people aren't thinking. I just, there's no words. I mean, people don't realize when they get behind the wheel of a vehicle, they're driving a loaded weapon. You have to be respectful, not just for yourself, but for passengers. For, I drive the highway, I have four children at home and a husband. I want to go home at the end of the day. I want to be safe. I want to be able to, to drive on that highway and not have to worry about traffic that's coming my way. I get stuck behind vehicles all the time. It happens. Just this week I was down to 30 kilometers an hour with about 40 vehicles behind a, a, an oil tanker. If I'm five minutes late for work, I'm five minutes late. I'm not in a morgue. I, I, if you look at the video, it also it continues, and then you see another character crossing a, a double line on this dangerous stretch of highway that you had an accident on. I mean, do you ever ask yourself, like, what the hell is wrong with people? 
There are words that aren't fit for television that I repeat to myself over and over in the vehicle. Just last week, I went out $130 for a dash cam, best $130 I ever spent. It gives me a sense of security to know that if something comes up, I'm sending it to the RCMP. I don't care. I'm tired, tired of seeing every single day, like the stupidity of people. Police presence, absolutely needed. Passing lanes, needed. Now on the passing lanes, you are the person who started this petition. You've got, last count, you had 8,500 signatures? 8,592 to be exact, and they're still signing. Um, the accident on Friday was, it was a kicker for me. I was hoping to get 10,000, but I contacted Minister uh, Steve Cracker and I sent the petition through. I said enough is enough. We need cops on that highway. You need federal support. It has to be done. Like now, there, in, in that instance of that accident, there's some suggestion that there may have been a, a distracted driving issue. Like passing lanes would not be a solution for every single problem with driving, absolutely right? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But it would give, you know, if you are stuck behind vehicles, not everybody does the speed limit. I get frustrated with those drivers. Passing lanes, especially on inclines where a lot of commercial traffic just can't, uh, you know, they can't keep up. You know, they got heavy loads. The Bay Roberts area is a very high industrial area, so there's a lot of commercial vehicles that go back and forth. And there's nowhere safe. There's one place on that highway that I am comfortable to pass with nothing coming. And it needs to be done. Like, at least it gives people like myself, you know, we have a chance to get through. We have our own lane. But you still get chills and heebie-jeebies when you go back to where your accident happened, right? Every day. Every day. I mean, I drive past it on the highway and my stomach rolls. And it's... And, and like I've said before, it's a silver lining for me because I'm a lot more aware of everything that's going on around me. Um, I'm a lot more cognizant, not just what's in front of me, but what's behind me. I always look for an out and, you know, play different scenarios. Some people may say, oh, you're a nervous driver, but I don't think I'm a nervous driver. I'm a cautious driver. Last question. Your advice for people driving Veterans Memorial Highway is? Slow down. Slow down. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Well, late this afternoon, police released their Thanksgiving weekend driving statistics. Oh, and get a load of this. The biggest one that stands out, over 600 people were stopped for speeding and aggressive driving. Those are some uh, pretty disturbing numbers for sure. And yeah. uh, Ryan's here now to have a look at the weather and real cool down today. You can really feel it. Huge temperature drop. In fact, the temperatures basically cut in half from where they were yesterday, especially in central parts of Newfoundland, uh, where we're looking at current temperatures in the 7, 8, 9 degree range. Again, we hit 20 degrees in Gander yesterday, so a huge drop uh, for everybody across the island. Labrador, a drop for you folks as well, just three degrees right now in Labrador City if you're heading out. And again, it's thanks to this low, which is pulling away, area of high pressure coming in from the west. And so a nice, solid northwest flow. Now I say nice, but... Uh, and that is, of course, uh, open to interpretation. Uh, nice if you like the cooler fall temps, no question about that. And we are already seeing some showers, onshore showers, uh, firing up over western parts of Newfoundland. The radar indicating that we could be seeing a few of those uh, higher elevation flurries already mixing in. That chance certainly enhanced through the overnight tonight. Gross morn, uh, long range mountains, good chance of some higher elevation flurries mixing in. And so if you are heading out tomorrow morning uh, and you're driving uh, from, uh, say, Rocky Harbor back towards the Cornerbrook region. Don't be surprised if you do see some wet flurries in the mix. Best chance, though, is certainly over Labrador as temperatures dip to and below the freezing mark. Smooth sailing for St. John's and central Newfoundland, but that changes for the afternoon and evening. I'll uh, have the updated forecast uh, for you in just a few minutes. Debbie? Thanks very much, Ryan. Well, in Toronto, a petition calling for an Indigenous restaurant to remove seal from its menu may have backfired. The petition called on Kukum Kitchen to stop serving seal. But since then, Chef Joseph Schwana says there's been an outpouring of support and he's fully booked for the next few weeks. And as Shannon Martin reports, he's planning to add more seal to the menu. Portion right here. Chef Joseph Schwana prepares what's quickly becoming his signature dish, seal tartare. We weren't going to have it on the menu and then we just pretty much bit the bull and just said this is something we got to do and it's our way to pay homage to our northern brothers and sisters who sustains their life on seal and seal fur and just the whole seal hunt itself. The appetizer setting off a worldwide debate as a petition demands his small restaurant no longer serve seal. Was it hurtful to read some of those things? It's, it stings a lot, especially when 
people are counting on me to bring people to this place and fill it up and pay the bills and pay them and so they could pay bills and put food on their tables. We reached out to the woman who started the petition and she didn't want to do an interview with us but she sent an email. She said she supports the Indigenous hunt of seals and Indigenous people's rights but she says her issue is the fact that the seals that are served come from the commercial hunt. Where we get our seal meat from is from uh, CDNA so they're really federally regulated. They're all certified. Their processing plants are certified. Their hunters have to go through rigorous training to become seal hunters. They only met 15% of their quota out of 440,000. That's uh, showed me a positive thing on their side that they don't want to just go out and get as much as they can. They get, go out and get what they need and, and that's it. And that's our way of life too. It's, we take what we need. We don't take what, everything that we we can grab. It wasn't just the petition, but you started to see people going online and putting reviews on Google and Facebook, like really low star reviews. Are you worried about that impacting your business? Well, personally, that's that, that was a huge low blow. I can't wrap my head around somebody, uh, something like that, where somebody can rate a restaurant, the whole ambiance of the place, all the way down to the food, to like how it smells in here. And it's, um, it's uh, very childish. Everything that we have in the restaurant, we sourced and we do our, did our due diligence and we researched months on end before we even came up with uh, a menu. So you're gonna keep serving oh, seal? Yeah. yeah, we're having two seal dishes on the menu, the next, uh, next menu rollout, which is next week. So. And you're fully booked for the next few weeks. Yeah, yeah it's gonna be pretty crazy here. Yeah. <laughs> Shannon Martin, CBC News, Toronto. Driving the Trans-Canada Highway in central Newfoundland just got a little bit smoother. After years of waiting, the new Sir Robert Bond Bridge is finally open. Here now's Garrett Berry takes us there. Fresh pavement, wide roads. It's a world of difference now when you're crossing the Exploits River near Botwood. You used to bridge yourself structurally, it's a lot wider, and it's certainly a lot safer from what we're used to. But it took years to get here. The money was announced in 2012, a frustrating wait for some. Oh, I can't remember how long it did take. Was I born, I wonder? I'm only 80 years old. I think we started before I was born. <laughs> no, it took a long time, but then again, it's slow work. You're work working over a river. While the new bridge was built, the old one was repaired. Delays this summer drove some over the edge. Police were even called. Yeah, we definitely would have liked to have seen it done sooner because it has created, you know, some headaches and some burdens, you know, when it comes to wait times and this type of stuff. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I've got no problem waiting a little bit of extra time uh, to get, uh, to get a, uh, the, the new bridge done and done correctly. After five years and about 22 million, the only thing missing to mark this replacement, a party. Like they had when the first bridge was opened way back in the late 1950s. Garrett Berry, CBC News. Bishop's Falls. This old school in St. John's will soon be gone. Demolition crews are at the site of the former I.J. Sampson this week tearing it down. The English school district sparked a controversy last year when it sold a 70-year-old building for $189,000, about one-tenth of its value. It was later put on the market for a sale price of almost $2 million. Well, a homegrown musical is taking in some major cash. Farewell to all you pretty ladies waving from the dock. Be the way, me jolly see the way. After less than eight months on Broadway, Come From Away has already recouped its $12 million investment. Some experts say it usually can take up to two years for a big show to recover costs. And it may heave in even more when Come From Away comes back home to Canada. The show about Gander's reaction to the 9-11 disaster will return to Toronto in February with Winnipeg dates and a North American tour planned for next year. Up next, what government is doing about the disturbing report that ambulances and Happy Valley Goose Bay are slow to respond to emergencies.
As Bailey White reported earlier, a provincial government review is slamming the Labrador Ambulance Service in Happy Valley Goose Bay, saying the private company only met the terms of its contract half the time. That includes inordinately long wait times for an ambulance to respond to a call. One woman says a delay of an hour for an ambulance to attend to her father may have resulted in his death. John Hagee is the Minister of Health. Minister Hagee, we've been reporting on the ambulance response time in Happy Valley Goose Bay, response times of 40 to 60 minutes for a number of months now. Why was that situation allowed to continue for so long? I think the problem has been, and I directed these questions uh, from uh, myself to Lab Grenfell, the issue is one of monitoring. We are still very much with the ambulance service in a paper-based self-reporting mode. Uh, we unfortunately found ourselves in a situation where we were paying for a service, it turned out we weren't getting, and as I said to Bailey, that was unacceptable. So who fell down on the monitoring, the board? I think what happened is there is an onus on the operator to supply data on request. The contract that they had, which is now nearly four years old, was actual fact more of a funding model. There was no service level provision beyond a very rudimentary one, and that addressed the issue of two ambulances available 24-7, and that was the only yardstick that we had. Once the, the comments came back from the community uh, and, and through Bailey and her team, uh, it was a trigger for uh, us to ask Lab Grenfell to look into it. Now, uh, you have said that Labrador Ambulance Service people should apologize to the people who've used the service up in ha Happy Valley Goose Bay. I'm wondering, though, what your responsibility and government's responsibility is. Well, you're right, we have a monitoring responsibility. Uh, what has happened because of the way the previous contracts were crafted was that that was very rudimentary. What we're moving to now is a system whereby in the short term for this particular provider, Labrador Grenfell will be doing not quite real time, but certainly very frequent monitoring on staffing levels and compliance with those elements of the contract that are written. <clears throat> what we're looking to do over the course of the next year to 18 months is to put in place an electronic central medical dispatch system, not just for Labrador, but for the entire province, which will provide us with hard data about response times, but equally to come up with a far more detailed service level kind of arrangement as we go forward with negotiations with the new uh, contract for ambulance provision. Now, speaking of service, the Labrador Health Board provides ambulance service just next door in a Lab West, it appears to be working well. Why hasn't that model been used? Why hasn't the Health Board provided ambulance service in Happy Valley Goose Bay? The ambulance services in this province were never designed. They grew up historically. If you look at how they evolved in, say, Lab West or even, say, in Gander, compared with some of the more rural areas, and in this case, Happy Valley Goose Bay, different arrangements prevailed at the time. And because of presumably historic factors, when the uh, ambulance services evolved, it, it went the same route. So we had a private operator to deal with in Happy Valley Goose Bay rather than an RHA run facility. So ambulance. you're not considering changing it? The ambulance service has been the subject in this province of two provincial reviews. Uh, and each of them has said we are not getting the value for money in broad brush terms uh, from the dollar we invest. Our challenge is to move from where we are now to a desired future state, and that would involve a central medical dispatch and then the uh, detailed integration of all ambulance operators, because there's actually several groups, into a unified ground ambulance system, and then how that would tie in with the air ambulance system. So those are a big... Uh, projects that we have to break down into manageable chunks and we have started on that. Now the private operators uh, association says really they're not being given enough money to provide the level of um, ambulance operators based on the wages that you're providing it, despite the fact that they have signed a contract to do so. How do you respond? Well, I mean, certainly the world may have changed, and that's one of the things we're going to talk about in our upcoming negotiations. But to loop back to the, the Happy Valley Goose Bay situation, essentially, uh, government through Lab Grenfell were paying for a service on a price agreed, and we were not getting that service. That's our current dilemma, and we're hoping to rectify it with some of the measures that Bailey and I spoke about earlier. I'm just wondering, is this whole situation with the private ambulance operator in Happy Valley Goose Bay, these inordinately long response times, has this all been a wake-up call for you? 
I think we have been aware of challenges in, in rural areas as well as urban areas uh, in terms of ambulances and response times. And I think it just reinforces uh, my desire to have the problem fixed. We have uh, material going hopefully to cabinet within the next couple of weeks to start to address the issue around central medical dispatch and getting a unified system so that there's one number you call and the number of links between the caller on the end of the phone in need and the ambulance crew is reduced to an absolute minimum and that's obviously been a factor uh, in, in this particular uh, scenario. So. We recognise the challenges, we have a long way to go, and we've started to take those first steps. Minister John Haggy, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Debbie. Well, up next, why the story of this man who saved dozens during a daring rescue a century and a half ago is making headlines again. This weather update is brought to you by the Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 400 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can too. Welcome back everyone. We knew it couldn't last forever. Uh, Flurries? In the <laughs> forecast for Newfoundland. Labrador, of course, it snowed like a month ago. <laughs> Newfoundland, you know, we need to really dip our toe into the water here slowly yeah. but surely, which we're going to do. I mean, we're talking about higher elevation flurries for 
The Long Range Mountains, Grossmorn, Massey Drive area in Corner Brook. Likely going to be seeing some flurries in that neck of the woods, maybe early tomorrow morning. Uh, so, Parker worthy? Uh, what kind of, how heavy? For you, probably. Yeah, I got your <laughs> Stokesy wears your parka right through till like June 15th. Uh, not quite that bad, but pretty wow. close. Uh, it is going to be really cool again tomorrow. Temperatures in the single digits across the board, and the winds are going to be, again, kind of gusty like they were today. Easing off just a little bit, but still some gusts in the 50 kilometer per hour range. I've got the sweater out there uh, for the weather headlines, but yeah, Stokesy, you can uh, swap the park out uh, for that uh, top headline there for you because we do have single digits Thursday and Friday. And again, with those winds gusting to 50 kilometers per hour Thursday, a bit of a wind chill factor in there. Showers, flurries, and yes, Grapple still talking about that because uh, it still looks like a pretty good possibility for the West Coast right through the day tomorrow. Northeast coast and central tomorrow afternoon into the evening. In case you missed it and you're wondering, what is grapple? Snow pellets is another way of saying that. Uh, warming for slowly warming for Friday and into Saturday as temps turning a little bit more mild. How about highs today? And you're wondering, I don't remember it being 14, 15 degrees. Well, these were very early morning temperatures. In fact, uh, some of those overnight and then the winds shifted to northwest and it was uh, back to reality. And there is where we sit right now in terms of current temperatures. Single digits for much of the day. We're back down to around 10 degrees in St. John's. It's just three degrees in Labrador City. The northwest winds ushering in that cooler air mass. We're looking at sustained winds right now near 41 in Bonavista. Some gusts near 50 there. That's generally where we've been today and that's generally where we'll be again tomorrow along those coastlines again. All that cool air wrapping around this low as it departs out into the Atlantic. Area of high pressure is moving in from the southwest, but kind of at a slow pace. So it will take almost a full day to clear us out through the day tomorrow. And we will continue to see these onshore flurries and even some higher elevation flurries. Not even out of the question as of now with that cold air aloft coming in. Very unsettled setup. That cold air hitting the open Gulf of St. Lawrence and we're seeing these showers fire up and some higher elevation flurries as I mentioned possible through tonight along that west coast into tomorrow morning. Cornerbrook, Grossmorn. Now as we work throughout to tomorrow morning, again a very quiet start eastern and central Newfoundland. As we roll throughout the day though and that cold air comes in from aloft and uh, moves into central and eastern Newfoundland. I think we'll really see some uh, scattered showers popping up into the afternoon for this region and that's where we'll run the risk of seeing some of those snow pellets mixing in in those most uh, intense showers. Uh, that's where that cold air really gets pulled down from aloft and we can see that those snow pellets actually making it from the cold cloud tops right down uh, to the surface. And so that risk does continue through tomorrow evening and then eases off for Friday as we see some gradual clearing and a pretty nice Friday. Cool, but uh, a lot brighter and those shower chances will end. So tomorrow morning, three, four, five degrees across the island. We're talking about uh, temperatures in the one, two, three degree range uh, to as cold as minus three in Labrador City. So tomorrow, quiet start. Again, those shower chances into the afternoon. I think you're fine and smooth sailing along the south coast. A slight risk for the Buren Peninsula, uh, but uh, everybody else along the south coast will be quiet tomorrow. Shower chances into the afternoon and evening for the northeast coast, six, seven, eight degrees. Shower chances from pretty much start to finish with those risk of higher elevation flurries and grapple from start to finish along the west coast with just six, seven degrees there. Could get to 10 uh, places like Rose Blanche tomorrow along that southwest coast. And we are looking at two, three, four degrees along the west, uh, coast of Labrador tomorrow. Highs of just two in the west with a chance of flurries throughout. That's your forecast. Long range details are still ahead, Debbie. Thank you, Ryan. Well, it was a rescue that defied belief and grabbed headlines at the time. Captain William Jackman rescued 27 people from a foundering vessel off Labrador 150 years ago this week. Jackman came from a long line of seafaring captains. In Renews on the southern shore where Jackman was born, people want to revive the memory of their local legend. Here now is Chris O'Neill Yates has our story. In the October hurricane of 1867, Captain William Jackman would earn the status of hero. Jackman had taken shelter at Spotted Island in Labrador when he learned of a schooner sinking about 200 meters from shore. To be able to jump into that raging storm of water with that cold water and swim 27 times and take 27 people on his back. 
Mike Chidley and Glenn Jackman, a third cousin of Captain William, have started a heritage society in Jackman's name. Ever since I was a kid, when I first learned of this, uh, this act of heroism by a man who shared my birthplace and my surname, I, I couldn't contain my pride. I've just been so proud of that. Despite his feat of bravery, Captain William Jackman isn't even well known here in his home province. The Heritage Society in Renews wants to change that and make Captain William Jackman a household name, beginning right here in the town where he was born. Jackman entered the world in this house in Renews in 1837. Today, these steps are all that remain of his ancestral home. At the time of the rescue, newspapers hailed him as a hero. He actually received a year after uh, a, an award from the British Humane Society, a silver medal, which was the highest honor they could convey. A stamp was issued in his honor in 1992 as a legendary rescuer. Chidley and Jackman are pursuing their goal of memorializing Jackman with a monument in his birthplace. Undaunted by the lack of success in getting help from either federal or provincial governments. What do you think we lose if we don't remember people like this in history? Well, we lose who we are as a people. Uh, that's what we lose. Jackman died at the age of 39. The newspaper article said it was the biggest funeral ever in St. John's. Uh, uh, the parade or whatever marched a mile and a half. Speculation was that Jackman died young, having never recovered from the ordeal of saving 27 lives in a raging gale. A sacrifice people here in the outport of his youth are determined to honor. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, Renews. Up next, the inspiring story of a Labrador woman who used her own struggle to improve the rights of others. Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, next is a story about a woman from Labrador who made her mark on adoption law reform in Ontario. The decade-long fight was her personal passion and for very good reason. Marilyn Shirley gave up her son for adoption when she was 19 years old, a decision that shaped her life as a person and a politician. She was in St. John's getting an honorary degree from Memorial University and talked to us about the trauma of being pregnant and unwell in the 1960s. 
And Shirley? For much of Marilyn Shirley's adult life, she bit her tongue when asked how many children she had. She would answer with a half-truth. I used to say one, but in my mind, I'd always go two. There was all, in my mind, that I always had two children. She gave birth to her first child when she was 19 years old. She was attending university in Ontario, away from her parents and her home in Happy Valley, Labrador. The father of her baby wasn't in the picture. It was a devastating thing to happen in my life, and I hid it from my parents and hid out and managed to... Uh, you know, get, managed to keep it a secret. Because the times were very different back then. Anybody who's been around for a while won't know that the 60s, late 60s into the 70s, it was turn on, tune out, drop out, uh, free love. A lot of women, you know, were getting pregnant at the time because, believe it or not, um, birth control was illegal for unmarried women, abortion was illegal, and there were very few options. And of course, having a child out of what was then called out of wedlock was a, a fate worse than death. So she only had one choice, have the baby, a boy she named Andrew, and then give him up for adoption, a choice that changed her forever. During the birth, she was all alone and would get no sympathy from the hospital staff. One nurse slipped a, a gold band into my hand and said, dear, dear, she was trying to be helpful but uh, you should pretend you're married, then uh, people will treat you better. And I, I said no, and she, she called me a, a shameless hussy. So the hard part was after he was born. It was a real baby, and I wasn't allowed to hold my baby back then. I, the nurses thought they were doing the right thing. They thought, well, uh, if, if you get to hold the baby or touch the baby, it means you'll get too close to it and we're trying to protect you. That was the prevailing attitude at the time. But there was also an attitude that I was a bad girl and I should be punished. And not there was, I, there was the, the, the double jeopardy there. And when I was leaving the hospital, I tried then to, to let them at least bring him to me. But they, I could only say goodbye to him through the glass. And that's when you change something clicks in your mind, you, you kind of grow up. You're, you're, um, you're in a different plane, you know, you're a mother now, even though you're not going to raise your child. A reality that was difficult to digest. She tried to move on, but her son was never far from her mind. Thought about him all the time, lit a candle on his birthdays. Year after year, Charlie searched for her son, but adoption laws stood in her way. The laws at the time made it very difficult for us to get each other's information. Both parties had to apply to the government, and there were, it wasn't a priority, so there could be a seven-year list, waiting list for them to even check to see if there was a match. And if there wasn't, no go. You get no information. And that's what happened to me. My feet are off the floor. She became a politician in Toronto, first municipal, then provincial, as a new Democrat. In the early 1990s, she began a crusade to change the adoption laws. There was bitter opposition to it. Many people have secrets, including men who had, I'm sure, and some confessed to me quietly, were afraid they might get that proverbial knock on the door. There were a lot of myths about um, opening up records to adult adoptees and their, their birth parents. So uh, it took a long time to change the laws. Eventually, a group called Parent Finders helped Shirley track down her son, now named William, and she wrote him a letter. Then came a phone call. Then they finally met face to face. And I knock on the door and everything goes very quiet. You know, I, I can't hear anything anymore. I'm in the moment. I'm thinking, that door is going to open up and all these years I've been waiting to find him and meet my son and it's going to open up and he's going to be there and it just went very quiet. And then the door opened and he was there and we just stood and stared at each other. We just took each other in with our eyes for a long time. And then I didn't know what was going to happen and he reached out his arms and gave me a big hug. So then I knew everything was going to be okay. It was the first time she had ever held her son in her arms. Something that I had been dreaming about, longing for, for all those years, and here it was, the reality, solid, real, the real boys, right here. It was incredible.
It took 29 years to find her son. Her search may have been over, but her fight was not. She persisted in the legislature for a decade to change the adoption disclosure laws. It's really changed things. After the bill was finally passed by the Liberal government based on my, my work, uh, I mean the whole legislature erupted. And um, I had so many letters and emails from people saying, telling me, which was really gratifying, how much it's changed their lives. But there was still one dreaded task left to do. She had to tell her parents they have a grandson. They were watching TV, both of them hard of hearing. And I'm upstairs, what am I, how am I going to do this? I'm singing, Jesus loves me, this I know. And I just said, yelled it because they're hard of hearing. You have a grandson you don't know about. And it's like, what? <laughs> and he looked at me and said, well, after all, he is our grandson, so we'd like to meet him. And that changed everything. And of course, they did meet him. And, uh, you know, she has such an interesting story to tell. But what really left out at me was the nurse uh, calling her a shameless hussy. Can you imagine? Yeah, different times back then. I suppose some of that still exists today. But uh, hopefully we're moving beyond that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It definitely stuck with her because she wrote a book called Shameless. That's about the search for her son. And she told me that uh, even though she was supposed to feel shame in the eyes of the public and society, she never actually did. Yeah, great. Great story, great story. It's a race across the Australian outback on the rays of the sun. Over 40 teams from around the world, including Canada, are competing this week in the World Solar Challenge. Cars race at speeds of up to 100 K an hour, powered only by the sun. And let's meet our young athlete of the day. This is Jared Stapleton of Marystown, four years old and loves sports. He enjoys playing soccer, t-ball and hockey. Great job keeping active, Jared. You're today's young athlete of the day. Okay, well, 
he, we've got the long range to have a look at. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. And temperatures again cool the next couple days. We're warming towards the weekend, though. Let's have a look at how things are playing out. Satellite radar picture shows our low pulling away and that cool northwest wind funneling in behind. That's firing up the showers and onshore flurries along the west coast already. And we're going to be seeing that as we roll through tonight and through the day tomorrow. Here's how it's all going to play out. Chilly temps again really rolling in throughout the overnight, not just at the surface, but aloft as well. And that's what's going to make things so unsettled tomorrow along the west coast through the day into the afternoon. That cold air arrives aloft and that's where we'll see our best chance of some scattered showers and the possibility of some grapple mixing in along the northeast coast, even into metro for tomorrow evening. Uh, the threat again continues right through the day on Thursday along the west coast, as does the chance of some higher elevation flurries, places like Grossmorn, even Massey Drive in the Cornerbrook area, not out of the question. Now, uh, highs tomorrow just six, seven, eight degrees, a little bit warmer along the south coast of the island, uh, two to six degrees for the most part in Labrador. Some sun breaks in there, but a pretty good chance of a wet flurry uh, or a shower, especially in the east through the day. Now, note as we move into Friday, area of high pressure comes overhead. Chance of a lingering early morning shower along the northeast coast and for St. John's. But that will clear pretty quickly. In fact, they don't even have it in the forecast there because they think that chance is so early in the morning and generally temps eight, nine degrees. So a little bit warmer, which is good news uh, and even warming in Labrador, eight, nine degrees chance of a late day shower in Labrador City that is tied to our next system, which rolls in Friday night in through Saturday. Saturday is a cloudy, damp one from start to finish across the big land. We'll bring in some shower chances uh, for the afternoon for western parts of the island. It's a late afternoon evening risk for places like Grand Falls, Windsor, Gander, Central Newfoundland. Clouds certainly increasing, but we're dry and certainly a lot more mild across the island when we're into the low teens across eastern parts of Newfoundland. Now, those best chances of showers and rain move through Saturday night on the island. We're clearing out in what looks like a pretty well dry Sunday. Watching this system for next week, Monday, rain for the island. But how about this snow potential for southeastern Labrador? And the Northern Peninsula will be keeping an eye on that one over the next couple of days as the cold air continues to push south. Warm up though for Newfoundland, you can see 15, 16 degrees St. John's in the east. It's western Newfoundland and the Northern Peninsula that tap into that cool air again Monday and into Tuesday. Temps really bottoming out on the other side of that system. And there's that snow potential Happy Valley Goose Bay and eastern Labrador for Monday. We'll be watching that closely over the next couple days. Well, briefly now in national and international news, two people have been charged in Calgary with what police call a brutal series of murders last summer. This man and woman each face one count of first degree murder in the death of a 26 year old man. His body was found on a highway west of Calgary in mid July. Two days earlier, three other bodies were found in a burning car in a city neighborhood. Police say those victims were in the wrong place at the wrong time. There's more fallout in the Harvey Weinstein scandal. More than a dozen women have accused the powerful movie producer of sexual harassment. Now Weinstein's wife says she's ending their decade long marriage. Georgina Chapman released a statement saying, quote, my heart breaks for all the women who have suffered tremendous pain because of these unforgivable actions. Weinstein is facing a growing number of claims he mistreated women in the entertainment industry over many years. Yesterday, both Angelina Jolie and Gwyneth Paltrow said he had sexually harassed them. Weinstein was fired from the company he helped found earlier this week. At least 17 people have been killed so far in California's fast-moving wildfires. There are 17 major fires burning across the state, more than a dozen of them raging in wine co country uh, north of San Francisco. More than 3,500 buildings are destroyed and more than 20,000 people have been forced out of their homes. Our beautiful weather picture of the day. I think we're going to see a lot of scenes like this over the next couple of weeks and bring it on. Beautiful colors. Where is this one? Somewhere in Central. I'll let you know after the break.
All right, before the break, we asked you uh, where our viewer picture was taken. Debbie Cooper with the sharp eyes <laughs> said there's a hiking trail in that picture, which is a great call, Debbie. The Hazel Knight Hiking and Adventure Trail, <clears throat> excuse me, which is in Robert's, Robert's Arm, Arm. Ah. which is, of course, uh, in central Newfoundland uh, in the Pillies Island region. And there's another look at that picture, which is fantastic. That picture makes me want to go. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to stroll through that. That is just fantastic. I love that the just the way she framed that picture with the the, the foreground leaves that are nice and green, and then the, of course in the in the background the nice uh, reds and oranges. Looks like it's glowing. Absolutely. <laughs> As you said, we're probably going to see a lot more of that over the next couple of weeks, would you say? Yeah. Yes, hopefully even longer. We keep the windstorms to a minimum and they yeah. last a lot longer. <laughs> Good. Well, you have some, con no, you don't have any control. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> see everyone tomorrow. Good night. Good night. <laughs>